welcome to an event uh, which uh, has grown out of uh, a long, nine-year-long connection between Exeter College, of which I'm the head, and the Said Business School. I came here nine years ago having been a journalist on The Economist magazine uh, for most of my life and was rather startled to find that Oxford colleges had really not a lot to do with the business school, which was clearly a place uh, on an upward trajectory. And it seemed to me that it would be uh, interesting for our students to know a bit more about the business school. And for the business school students, and some of you I know are at rather recently founded colleges, to know a little bit more about Oxford's fourth oldest college, Exeter College, uh, which has been around since 1314. So next year is our 700th anniversary. And in order to achieve this, I set up a series of uh, talks uh, under the title of Exeter at the Said and invited a mixture of uh, alumni of the college who had had interest in careers in business and uh, people who were old friends. And tonight's speaker falls into the second category and he has very generously uh, allowed himself to be talked into coming here to talk to all of you this evening. I have to say that uh, in the time I've known David Sainsbury, um, he has had one of the most remarkable careers of anyone I can think of, actually probably the most remarkable career that I can think of. Um, he uh, was, when I first knew him, um, a relatively young executive at Sainsbury, which as most of you will have discovered by going and doing some late night shopping, um, is one of Britain's most <coughs> successful uh, supermarket chains. It was founded by his great grandfather um, in the uh, 1860s. Um, and he uh, went on to become uh, the finance director and then the chairman of Sainsbury's. Um, and so he has had, a, first of all, an interesting and important career at the helm of a very significant British company. But he left um, uh, Sainsbury and uh, instead became a government minister. Um, he had been a, a supporter of the Labour Party, a financial supporter of the SDP and then latterly of the, of the Labour Party. Um, and uh, he, uh, when um, the Blair government was elected, he became a minister of science, a minister of science and innovation. And he held the job um, from 1998 through to 2006. And this was very important because no, I think no other minister, I don't think probably no other minister, pretty much in my lifetime, with the exception maybe of one or two chancellors of the Exchequer, has been in the same job for eight years. And what's important about that is that most government policy takes about eight years to formulate. Um, and he was a very successful uh, minister of science with a real sense, a real grasp of what uh, science was about and what the government could do for it. And then he had a third career, um, which began in <coughs> his, really, I suppose, in his 20s, as a philanthropist and founded uh, in, the, uh, in, in the 1960s um, a trust called uh, the Gatsby Foundation. Or rather, all of you will, um, I think, probably resonate with that name. Um, and it became a vehicle for funding science, education, and uh, sanity in government. Um, it uh, didn't spray money about. It was very targeted and has, for example, uh, created and supported uh, the Institute for Government, which is an institute which is designed to help both government and opposition politicians prepare for political transitions and government to raise the intellectual caliber and, and experience of ministers. Um, and then um, a, a fourth career uh, has appeared, latterly, um, two years ago, he was elected Chancellor of the University of Cambridge. Um, uh, it was a, a, a university which, as a, an alumnus, he had supported, but it was quite clear from the electoral votes cast uh, 
that he didn't um, get a shoe in just because of that. He stood against some pretty formidable opposition and he won by a considerable popular majority. So he is, as it were, Cambridge's Lord Patton, but without the entanglements of the BBC and elsewhere that our Chancellor has had <coughs> to deal with. And he has written, and I'm not going to talk much on it, but he has written a very remarkable book, which is what he's going to talk about tonight. It's called Progressive Capitalism, How to Achieve uh, Economic Growth, Liberty and Social Justice. And I shall wave it around again at the end of the talk so that you can all write it down and go off and buy a copy <coughs> on Amazon tonight. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to uh, let him talk. While he talks, think of some good questions because uh, he's very open to that and we will have, uh, I hope, about half an hour for questioning at the end. Um, I just one last thing. Uh, the the um, members of the audience from Exeter College think that this talk begins in about five minutes' time. So if they come clumping in at that stage, please be tolerant with them and please help them find somewhere to sit down, even if it's only on the steps. Thank you very much. David. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Francis, for those words. I, I have to say there were two longer-serving ministers, but they were the Prime Minister. Well, there were three, actually. There was the Prime Minister, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and another, I think, uh, Minister of Agriculture, who shortly afterwards went to prison. But other than that, uh, I was the longer-serving minister. Um, I should also say that, um, actually, one of the um, things you didn't mention, which I'm uh, very pleased to have done, was actually go to an American business school um, in the late uh, 50s, the late 60s, and that was one of the most, um, in America, I went to the Columbia Business School to get my MBA, and that was one of the most, um, I think, interesting, valuable bits of, of my life. And I'm very delighted to have the opportunity uh, to talk to you this evening, uh, because one of the aims um, of writing Progressive Capitalism was to put firms and entrepreneurs firmly back uh, into economic growth theory. Uh, because uh, neoclassical economic growth theory has tended uh, to focus solely on the allocation uh, of capital and labor and really to ignore uh, the accumulation of organizational and technological capabilities of firms, it's always seemed to me to inhabit uh, a world which is very different uh, from the one which uh, you inhabit in a business school. And as a consequence, it actually has remarkably little uh, <coughs> relevance to policymakers. And I thought this was something that needed to be changed. Of course, a lot of neoclassical economists would say, well, that's just because businessmen uh, are very ignorant people who don't understand our mathematical models. Uh, I would dispute that. Uh, and I think there is something wrong uh, if economic growth theory uh, has no role for it uh, in, for firms uh, and entrepreneurs. And that's perhaps something we can talk about uh, after the talk. When I left uh, the government in 2006, um, I believed, uh, like pretty well everyone else, uh, that the economy was doing well and the Labour government uh, was doing a good job uh, managing it. And it was, uh, well, I think actually the first moment uh, that I realised things were not, not going well uh, was um, I came out of government in November 2006 and then I had to go I had to wait for three or four months before I could talk to any of the people who handled my investment. Uh, this was on the theory that, of course, we had, we were, you know, being in the D uh, DTI, one had one's hands on lots of enormously valuable information, which would enable you to make good stock, uh, pick good stocks, and obviously that wasn't right. So I had to wait three or four months. Um, and then I sat down with uh, the people who um, helped me on investments. And um, at that moment, they said, uh, look, we're quite worried um, about what's going on. Uh, we think uh, the um, investment management world has kind of lost control of things. And they described various incidents and then said, and of course, there's this thing called subprime mortgages on the horizon. Um, and we're extremely worried. We think there might be a small further increase and then there will be a crash. And I remember at the time thinking, you know, do I read up? Uh, Gordon and Alistair and say, look, um, uh, <laughs> it's not quite what you keep telling everyone in government. And then I thought, now look, you're, you're getting, um, you're getting overexcited at coming out of government. And I didn't do it. Uh, I wonder if actually at, at that point I went up and said, look, uh, 
Uh, you just ought to get in contact with what's happening. But that was the first intimation. But it was only really with uh, the financial crash of, of 2008 uh, <coughs> that it, uh, I began to really think uh, whether these neoliberal kind of principles, which we had all been operating on with a greater or less enthusiasm, the neoliberal view of the world uh, was correct. Um, as governments across the world frantically uh, sought to save their financial systems, it seemed to me it was no longer possible uh, to argue that markets were self-regulating and self-correcting. And it seemed to me, and there was no role for the state. I mean, we had basically been operating on a principle that markets self-correcting, self-regulating, and there really was no role uh, for the state uh, in the economy. And it seemed to me at this point, uh, you couldn't go on maintaining that view and we needed a new political economy uh, on the left particularly and in my book Progressive Capitalism um, I've tried to set one out. I think the first uh, point that needs to be made about Progressive Capitalism it's based on a very firm belief uh, in capitalism which I think can be uh, defined by two very simple features. Uh, first of all it's an economic system where most of the assets are privately owned. That is, we believe, if you believe in capitalism, you believe that productive assets are best held by individuals because they are the people who will make certain they're used to best effect. And second, you believe it's an economic system uh, where production is guided and income is distributed largely through the operation of markets. And those are two principles I strongly believe in, and they are what distinguishes really capitalism from either feudal system which went before this, or indeed a planned uh, economy such as Russia uh, used to have. But as well as those, these principles of capitalism, I think progressive uh, capitalism really incorporates three defining beliefs of progressive thinking. They are, first of all, the crucial role uh, of institutions. Uh, secondly, the need for the state to be involved in the design of institutions in order to resolve conflicting interests and provide public goods. And the use of social justice, defined as fairness, uh, as an important measure of a country's economic performance. Let me say a little bit more about uh, these three uh, defining beliefs of progressive thinking. I think it's been a great mistake of neoclassical economists uh, not to see capitalism as a socio-economic system. To see it simply uh, in terms of economic forces, uh, I think is to have too narrow a view of capitalism. And it means, of course, right from the start uh, that you ignore a great deal of the empirical studies about economic growth. Uh, because those will show, uh, the empirical studies will show, uh, that four institutions, four kinds of institutions, have a major impact on the performance of firms and therefore on the performance of a country. I think you have to go, you have to go back and put firms firmly at the centre of economic growth theory uh, and then you can start looking at what are the crucial issues, which is what are the, uh, what are the institutions which affect the performance uh, of companies. <coughs> the four institutions uh, which I think affect the performance of companies are the institutions which underpin financial and labour markets, the institutions which underpin the governance of firms, a country's education and training system, and its national uh, system of innovation. The national system of innovation being defined as that network of institutions in the public and private sector whose activities and interventions uh, initiate, import, modify and diffuse uh, new technologies. For example, if you take the performance of a company, it's very affected uh, by the, the way that it's governed. Whether or not it takes a long-term view of investment or focuses solely on short-term profits, and whether it's prepared to put resources into training young people depends on how it's governed and its relationship uh, with shareholders. And in spite of the Cadbury report uh, and the many reports it spawned, I think that the moment the governance uh, system in the UK uh, is not working well and I would give two examples of that. Uh, the first is the payment uh, to executives which seems to me way out of control uh, and certainly the very short-term uh, approach 
which is now taken by uh, many, many uh, companies. Uh, the idea of, share, of uh, the rewards for um, executives uh, being based on shareholder value, in theory, is, a, is a, a very attractive idea. Uh, but of course, what no one ever worked out, and which is now quite clear, is that of course it's a system uh, which can be abused to a great extent. And what I think we've seen uh, in recent years is huge increases to executives which are in no way related uh, to um, uh, the underlying performance of the companies. Again, that's something we can, we can talk about. I think also, um, because in many cases uh, these uh, various bonus schemes and so on were related to return on equity, they have actually had a very uh, bad effect uh, on, uh, on actually the way that executives look at the long-term performance of their company. Um, you will, I'm sure, as um, in the business school, will appreciate uh, that you can have a situation, and it's, I think, the situation we've got now, where companies, uh, executives, are focused um, on the return on equity, uh, because that's what their bonuses are linked to. And, of course, in those circumstances, uh, if you have spare cash, you may say, uh, actually, it's better in terms of our rewards to put that money into buyback of shares rather than into long-term investment because the quickest way to get your return on equity up is actually to lower the, the amount of equity. And that can lead you, obviously, to make mistakes about long-term investment, but it also, of course, uh, is part of the reason uh, why so many institutions have been <coughs> run uh, at absurd uh, amounts of leverage uh, which was, of course, one of the things that contributed uh, to the failure of the banks. Uh, we shouldn't be talking about whether we have four, 3 or 4% equity uh, in banks. We should be talking about whether it's 15 or 20%. So those two examples where an institution, that is the system of reward for executives, uh, has a major impact uh, on their performance. The second defining belief of progressive thinking is that the state has to be involved in the design and reform of a country's institutions. Uh, institutions do not evolve sp spontaneously, um, as neoliberals believe, and the state has to be involved because in, this, in the case of institutions, which underpin labor and financial markets and corporate governments, it has to it resolve conflicting interests of participants. And in the case of a country's education and training uh, system and its national system of innovation, they are public goods, which largely have to be provided uh, by the state. Um, if you take the case of, uh, uh, um, uh, well, if you take the case of, for example, uh, corporate governance again, um, one of the is big issues here, of course, is the relationship between investors and companies. Uh, one of the last things I had to do um, as a minister, um, I, I was the DTI minister in the House of Lords, which meant I had to deal with all the issues that DTI uh, dealt with. And one of the last things I had to do, uh, which was probably the cause I got out of government, uh, was to take the 2006 company bill uh, through the House of Lords. Uh, of course, be my luck, uh, that was the biggest bill ever to go through Parliament. Uh, most bills have about um, 70, 80 clauses. Uh, the company bill 2006 had, two, uh, had um, uh, 800 clauses to start with and by the time we had finished and consolidated some more legislation it had 1400 clauses and the way these things work is you go through them one by one uh, debating them uh, and it took us 72 hours to debate this and I have to tell you it is not the most exciting thing uh, you've ever debated in your life. Um, and. Of course, what you realize at the end of this is that a little bit of this, which has to do with the relationship between employer and employee, but the great mass of it um, is legislation which relates to the relationship uh, between shareholders uh, and managers. And you have to have an enormous amount uh, of legislation to control that relationship because you will not get people uh, to invest in companies uh, unless they have a clear view of what is the institutional legal framework uh, within which uh, managers uh, are operating. So those, those are the first two things, but I think at this point it's important uh, 
uh, to realize that the role of the state uh, that I've been describing uh, is essentially an enabling role or a market supporting one. It's not a command and control a role promoted by traditional socialists, nor is it the minimalist role uh, of neoliberals. Uh, progressive capitalism is not about looking back nostalgically um, either to clause four, uh, socialism, or to neoliberalism. The third defining belief of progressive thinking is that social justice uh, needs to be used as an important measure uh, of a country's economic performance. You'll find ne neoliberals uh, will always assess economic performance uh, in terms of economic growth and freedom. Uh, but I think if you're concerned with the well-being of society, uh, it's not possible to argue, for example, that a wealthy society, uh, with most of the wealth held in the top 1% of that society, uh, is better than a slightly less wealthy society uh, with wealth more evenly distributed. Uh, it's simply not possible to say the first is obviously uh, a better society than the second. Um, and if you look at some of the figures of wealth distribution uh, recently uh, in the US and the UK, uh, they are truly astounding and, and I think uh, pretty horrifying. If you take the US, um, if you take the period 1979 to 2005, and you take the actual cash sum extra uh, that accrued over that period to the top 0.1%, so this is 0.1%, uh, not 1%, 0.1% of the population in America, which is about 300,000 people, that sum is 50% more than the amount of money which went to the 180 million people uh, in the bottom 60%. I find it impossible to argue that that is the good society, that is a society where you're maximizing the, well, the well-being of, of people. And I think, therefore, uh, that you have to take social justice uh, into account, but I think the way you take it into account is also very important. Uh, I think uh, one of the failures of progressive thinking um, over the last 50 years uh, has been to talk about uh, social justice in terms of equality. Uh, I would prefer to think of it in terms of fairness, uh, some concept of fairness, rather than the concept uh, of equality. The reason for doing that is, first of all, it's extremely difficult uh, to devise practical and effective policies uh, to achieve uh, equality in a market economy. Uh, secondly, there is a clear trade-off uh, between equality and economic growth. You can have more equality but you will at some point uh, quite quickly uh, have a situation where you will get less economic growth because of that. It's not, it's not the kind of total neoliberal view in which any dis diminution uh, of um, wealth for the top people will immediately lead uh, to less economic growth, but there is some trade-off uh, between economic growth and real uh, equality. And the third reason is actually there's no one particularly uh, who's rooting for equality um, of incomes uh, in the economy. Uh, it's not even very popular. In fact, it's not popular at all uh, with many poor people. If you have any dealings uh, with uh, trade unions, uh, you will never hear the word equality mentioned other than in, co in context of equality between men uh, and women. Uh, in fact, you'll have the exact reverse. The debate will always be about the famous differentials, uh, much beloved of uh, trade unions, um, in which the argument is, well, if the work people on the work floor get this, we as maintenance engineers ought to get that plus 20%. So there's actually very few people in, the, in society uh, who actually want an equal society. But people do want um, some concept of a fair society. I think if you look at popular opinion in this country, um, it, it's very interesting that as a whole, if people set up businesses, they put their house at risk, they put uh, all their money at risk, they build up a business, uh, that makes good products, employs people, they train those people uh, and create lots of jobs. As a whole, the British public view, which is a view I totally share, is good luck to them and if they make a lot of money, that's fine.
What angers people is when they feel that people are walking away with those sums of money which do not reflect their contribution to society. Um, so people, actually, you didn't hear many complaints about bankers' bonuses when times were good. When the banks collapsed, were bailed out by government, and then the bankers emerged the days afterwards uh, with still having bonuses, uh, they were called retention bonuses rather than uh, normal bonuses, um, or when executives utterly fail to run a business and then walk away with huge rewards, uh, the average person is pretty angered by that uh, because they say that does not, that's not, in a sense, fair. And I have to say, um, uh, I, I'm pretty sympathetic to that, uh, that view also. Um, I think fairness also focuses attention uh, on the major causes um, of inequality in recent years, which is the pre-distribution of wealth, uh, the way that uh, the market distributes its rewards in the first place. Uh, the extraordinary wealth that we've seen uh, in the top 1% in countries like the USA and the UK is in fact largely due to two groups of people. Um, that top 1% is almost entirely populated by two groups of people. One is chief executives, and we've heard that their rewards are not um, wholly, in a sense, fair. And the other um, is, of course, people who worked um, uh, in the investment markets. And there, I think, actually, there's two other little groups. Uh, one is, is op <laughs> by and large, opera singers and a few artists, uh, who, if, if, you get, if you're an opera singer, of course, and you're the best opera singer, you can command incredible rewards across the world because you make a record, it sells across the world, CD, and you, uh, it, uh, it's sold across the world. Uh, if you're number three opera singer, of course, it doesn't really apply, but the top opera singers, there are a few opera singers, and then, of course, inevitably, there are a few lawyers uh, whose job it is to make certain that the other 1% of the population does not pay tax uh, on its money. Uh, but uh, that 1% is populated uh, by that group of people. Um, so you find that, the, for example, the average uh, pay of the chief executive uh, of Britain's FTSE 100 companies, for example, their salaries grew by 11% uh, in real terms between 1999 and 2006. That compares with 1.4 for uh, the rest of the population. I don't think that uh, reflects uh, the, their performance. It reflects uh, the way that um, various bonus schemes and so on uh, and share options were being manipulated. If you turn to the other group, which is the investment management world, uh, it's again, I think, a question of uh, a large amount of money being essentially creamed <coughs> off uh, the markets uh, by the financial executives. Again, not a reflection necessarily of performance. For example, if you take the um, annual inflation adjusted returns um, on UK pension funds uh, between 2000 and 2009, uh, it was in real terms 1.1%, uh, which, which compares with 4 to 5% real return uh, in the previous 40 years. So a really appalling uh, result, and of course that had a huge impact um, on uh, those pension funds and indeed the pensions that people got will get from them. Um, now you can say, uh, well of course, you know, you have decades which are good for investment and you have decades uh, which are bad for investment and of course it all depends when you, when you start the 10-year period and, and so on. Uh, the fact is though that that period, 2000-2009, was the period when the investment management uh, community made the very biggest uh, returns uh, and paid itself huge bonuses. And in fact, in that period, you'll find that 40%, 40 percent of the total corporate profits uh, in the UK were being made uh, by the investment managers. Now, it's very difficult, I think, to argue that was a reflection uh, of their good uh, performance. Um, in terms of returns for uh, pension funds and, and other bodies, uh, and not to see that actually it was about how much money you could cream off uh, the flow of dividends and <coughs> stock prices, which should have been flowing uh, from companies back uh, to the investors. 
So those are the three, I think, uh, uh, important um, uh, defining beliefs of progressive thinking, which I incorporate into my idea of progressive capitalism. I hope those uh, brief remarks help you to understand what I see as the political economy um, of progressive capitalism, uh, which I believe is, uh, is a more realistic and more useful political economy uh, for policymakers uh, than neoliberalism. I also believe, and this is to my mind very important, uh, that it also provides a, a framework uh, for tackling many of the problems our economies face. So it's not difficult to work from that uh, to define what the problems are and then look at what the policy uh, response is to be. So I hope my book is both, uh, if you like, a theoretical approach to political economy, but also uh, you can go, and the book does tries to do this, you can go from that to looking at particular problems and looking at the kind of solutions uh, that may be required. Um, uh, I've already, I suppose, uh, talked about really how it can uh, tackle the unfair distribution of rewards in our society. Uh, but I think it could also be used to make sense of uh, the current debate uh, about industrial policy. To me, it's an extraordinary uh, feature of the current political uh, scene uh, in the UK that industrial policy uh, is back on the political agenda. And you have Vince Cable, uh, the CBI, and the TUC all calling uh, for UK uh, to have one. Uh, as always with these things, it's, it's not absolutely clear what they mean by industrial policy or that indeed why they think uh, we should have one. And the fact that they all want one makes me think that they are all probably uh, referring to different, different things. In fact, it's absolutely certain they're referring to different things. Um, what is, of course, extraordinary from my point of view is um, uh, when I was in the DTI, I was in fact doing lots of things on innovation policy. Um, and, and indeed getting involved a bit in corporate governance. If at any point of that I had said, um, I think we should have an industrial policy, I would have been taken out by the special advisor to Secretary of State and been shot and told, you've got to get back on message. You know, being off message was, was the worst thing you could possibly do uh, as a Labour minister. Uh, and that would have been considered appalling. Start talking about industrial policy would have been considered absolutely appalling. Um, and of course, if you had done that, you would have had the CBI frothing at the mouth saying, you know, this is a return to all the bad policies of Labour government in the 1960s. Um, and it's absolutely appalling, but typical, of course, of a Labour government. Uh, these few years later, and the CBI uh, wants to have uh, an industrial policy. Uh, so I think, I think if you look at the framework I've given, that gives you a help at looking at what actually industrial policy uh, uh, should be. My own view is that if industrial policy means improving growth uh, by reforming in a coordinated way uh, the four sets of institutions I've mentioned, that is the institutions underpinning financial labour markets, corporate governance, uh, the country's system of innovation, and its education and training system, then I think that is uh, extremely valuable and should have the backing of business and trade unions. But if it involves uh, protectionism, and ministers and civil servants uh, picking specific companies and products to support or directing uh, companies to alter their corporate strategies, uh, it should be avoided like the plague. That is what we did in the 60s and 70s uh, and it was a huge mistake and caused endless problems and you shouldn't get into that space at all. So perhaps to say finally, uh, I think neoliberals uh, will always tell people that uh, they have no choice. Uh, but to submit to the harsh realities of an economic system uh, which cannot be changed. I think it's the job of uh, progressive politicians and policymakers uh, to tell people that there is plenty of room for choice and that we can build a better society uh, which combines economic growth, liberty and social justice uh, if we have the will and the desire to do so. Thank you very much. <laughs>